December 2022, a silent metric flips. C++ passes Java to become the third most popular programming language in the world in TOB rankings. By late 2024, it climbs to second, just behind Python. It didn't make headlines, no viral thread, no new C++ campaign, but in server farms, game engines, autonomous vehicles, and spacecraft, the world was already running on C++. For decades, it worked in silence, beneath the GUI, beneath the browser, in code no user ever saw. How did a language born in the 1970s, forged from academic frustration and systems pain, manage to survive every wave of abstraction, trend, and replacement attempt? To answer that, we go back to the beginning. Not to the beginning of code, but to the moment a young researcher at Bell Labs decided he needed to write a simulation. And neither of the world's best programming languages would let him. Bell Labs, late 1970s. A room full of humming hardware and worn terminals. Somewhere in the middle, Bjarne Struestrup, quietly debugging a simulation. The problem was distribution. Struestrup wanted to model how computer systems talk to each other, how to simulate communication under load, failure, and variation. Simula 67, with its elegant object-oriented structures, gave him the right model, but ran too slowly. BCPL could run it, but stripped the code of meaning, turning every abstraction into a chore. Neither worked, so in 1979, he began writing his own solution. He called it C with classes, a minimal grafting of Simula's structure onto C's speed. He wasn't trying to change the world, just trying to run his code. Within months, it compiled, ran, delivered real results, classes with inheritance, strong typing, efficient binaries, all working together. By 1983, the experiment had a name, C++, a quiet joke, a nod to the increment operator in C, not a revolution, an evolution. Inside Bell Labs, C++ proved itself. Simulations worked, systems code compiled. By 1985, Struestrup published the C++ programming language. The first commercial compiler, Cfront 1.0, was released, and C++ began to escape. In a world already talking about object-oriented programming, C++ brought something missing. Structure without slowness, reuse without a VM, a way to organize code and talk to the metal. By the end of the 1980s, universities were teaching it, companies were adopting it, a language community had begun to form, what had started as a local fix was now a global language. Late 1980s to 1990s, multiple compilers, multiple dialects, one language, no standard, GCC, Orland, Microsoft, each shipped their own version of C++. Developers coded with caution, knowing code might compile differently. Meanwhile, the language kept expanding, multiple inheritance, abstract base classes, templates and the STL, exceptions, namespaces and compile time polymorphism each feature answered a real problem, but also pushed the language toward complexity. In 1989, a formal standards committee formed, WG21. Five years of careful deliberation followed. In 1998, they published C++ 98, the first official international standard. It encoded everything, syntax, semantics, standard library, template behavior. T++ had a common reference and global identity. By then, C++ had already reshaped software. Operating systems used it. Windows, Linux subsystems, enterprise apps, Photoshop, Office, compiled in it. Graphics pipelines and 3D games were written almost entirely in C++. By 1995, it was one of the fastest growing programming languages ever. But power came at a cost. C++ gave control and required responsibility. Manual memory, pointer arithmetic, no guardrails, memory leaks, buffer overruns, undefined behavior. The same tools that let developers build empires could also take them down. Some warned against it. In the Linux community, one voice stood apart, louder, sharper, uncompromising. Linus Torvalds, architect of the Linux kernel, didn't just dislike C++, he banned it. He said, C++ is a horrible language. It's much, much easier to generate total and utter crap with it. Torvalds believed C++ encouraged abstraction at the expense of clarity, especially in low-level systems code. He rejected STL, rejected Boost, called them full of BS, warned that templates and generic code made behavior harder to predict, and in kernel work, unpredictability is danger. 
Yesterday's problem was getting massive C++ builds to compile, today it's decision overload. One tool for ChatGPT, another for Claude, another for image generation, another for code. Fragmented. Expensive. That's why Chat LLM Teams matters. All the top models. GPT 4.1, Claude Sonnet 4, Gemini 2.5 Pro, Grok 3, DeepSeek, and more. In one place. Root LLM picks the right model for your prompt. Create full docs and slides with deep research. Write and run code in Code LLM. For bigger jobs, DeepAgent builds apps, bots, sites, even research pipelines. AI image and video generation? Covered. ChatGPT's image model IDAGRAM, Recraft and Flux for images, Halo, Kling, Luma 1 and Runway for video, all for $10 per month. Far less than stacking separate subscriptions. Try chatllm.abacus.ai, link in description and pinned comment. All right, back to C++. When warnings came, some were blunt. Other prominent voices, not from outside, but from the very architects of computing, begin to speak. Donald Knuth, author of The Art of Computer Programming, calls C++ too complicated, impossible for me to write portable code, unless I avoid exotic features. Ken Thompson, creator of Unix and an early mentor of Strustrup, calls it a garbage heap of ideas, too big, too complex. Joshua Block, lead architect of Java's core libraries, warns that most shops limit themselves to a safe subset just to keep projects readable. Yet usage kept growing. C++ wasn't the easy choice, it was the necessary one. 2000s, a new century begins. So does the story of C++'s decline, or so it seems. Java, once young, is now mature. C Sharp arrives with Microsoft's backing. Python rises, so does PHP. JavaScript moves from the browser to the backend. Managed runtimes, memory safety, simpler syntax all gain momentum. C++ begins to look slow. Not in execution, in evolution. C++3 is released, a minor update, no headlines, and developers begin to whisper, where is C++0x? Years pass, the new version doesn't arrive, but underneath the foundation is shifting. The boost libraries emerge, unofficial, experimental, advanced, smart pointers, lambda functions, compile time tricks, modern patterns. Boost becomes a proving ground for the next phase of C++. Meanwhile, in high-frequency trading firms, C++ becomes indispensable. In finance, every nanosecond counts. Scripting languages don't qualify because their garbage collection is too slow. C++ powers the infrastructure behind billions of dollars in trades, every day. In gaming, C++ remains unmatched. Unreal Engine, CryEngine, Frostbite, all written in C++. No managed language can match the performance profile required for real-time interactive 3D. In embedded systems, automotive, aerospace, the story is the same. C++ stays. Then, after nearly a decade of preparation, everything changes. C++11 released. 2011, a new standard is published. And it feels like a reboot. C++11 introduces autotype deduction, lambda expressions, smart pointers in the standard, move semantics, multi-threading support, constexpr for compile time evaluation, Developers call it modern C++. The code looks cleaner, feels safer, behaves more predictably, but performance hasn't been sacrificed. Instead, C++ finds a new rhythm. A new three-year release cadence begins. C++14 simplifies and extends. C++17 brings structured bindings. If constexpr, std optional, variant, file system, C++20 introduces modules, concepts, and coroutines. The long-missing answers to headers, generic constraints, and async code. The language that once felt clunky is now multi-paradigm, procedural, object-oriented, generic, and functional. Meanwhile, the world is shifting again. Python dominates AI, but underneath TensorFlow on PyTorch is C++. Browsers, Chrome's Blink, Firefox, Gecko, are mostly C++. Databases, MySQL, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, all contain critical C++ code. Virtual reality, robotics, aerospace, embedded systems. Even where it isn't visible, C++ is there. By the early 2020s, the industry begins to see the language not as legacy, but as infrastructure. 2023, the industry faces a new question. Not, is C++ fast enough? But, is C++ safe enough? With manual memory comes risk. With unrestricted pointers come vulnerabilities. 
big tech companies start pushing for memory-safe languages, and in March 2025, Strustrup responds publicly, a call to help defend C++, not from competitors, but from being misunderstood. It isn't denial, it's an acknowledgement. C++ must evolve. Again, efforts intensify. The C++ core guidelines, static analysis tools, address sanitizers, cleaner defaults, stronger idioms, and still, the comparisons continue. Python is easier, but its speed comes from C++ libraries. Java and C-sharp are safer, but their VMs cost performance. Rust enforces safety, and Struustra praises its design, but lacks C++'s legacy and ecosystem. Experts predict coexistence, not replacement. Meanwhile, the community grows. CppCon fills auditoriums. Double G21 publishes every three years. Modern compilers optimize aggressively. Package managers BC Package and Conan modernize workflows. In universities, C++ remains often not the first language, but still the one that opens the next level. Those who master it don't just code, they shape systems. 2025, the world runs on software. Much of it still runs on C++. Game engines, trading systems, flight controllers, browsers, databases, not always visible, but always essential. It's not the language of trends, it's the language things are built with.